Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Leo Yaffe. I'm a core developer for the NXT blockchain protocol. Um, and today, today I'm going to talk about the design of the NXT blockchain. I'm, I'm going to touch uh, issues related to proof of stake um, versus uh, proof of work. I'm going to talk about the features of the existing NXT blockchain. And I'm going to talk about our next uh, version of uh, NXT, which we are uh, calling uh, Ardor. Um, so let's start. Um, first of all, quick introduction to NXT. Um, to anyone who is completely unfamiliar, NXT is a blockchain, which is uh, the, the, uh, the basic infrastructure that is also used by Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's, uh, so, so NXT is another protocol that implements a blockchain. It was launched in uh, November 2013. Uh, in the tradition of crypto by unknown developers that disappeared later. Um, it's based on completely new uh, source code written in Java. It has one minute block time. <coughs> uh, one billion tokens were distributed using uh, what we now call ICO to uh, random people that registered on the forum, <laughs> on the Bitcoin talk forum. Um, it's based on a proof of stake, um, which I will explain in a moment. Um, some of I here I assume some prior knowledge of Bitcoin, so I'll mainly mainly focus on the differences between NXT and Bitcoin. Um, with regards to accounts, accounts in NXT are almost like uh, Bitcoin addresses. Um, there are some subtle differences, which I, I'll, I'll touch uh, later. Transactions, it's the same thing. It's a, a, the basic uh, operation that uh, moves uh, tokens from address to address, but also much more. Um, in NXT, every transaction has only one thing, only single input address and single output address. Um, there is uh, the management is different than uh, Bitcoin. It does not. It is not based on uh, UTXO. Instead, each workstation, actually, in addition to the blockchain itself, each workstation uh, holds what we call derived tables that holds the balances of all accounts, which is the, exist, uh, the existing state of the blockchain. Um, in and unlike Bitcoin, which uh, only transfer value from address to address, uh, plus 40 bytes of OP return, NXT is designed from the ground up, from the ground up to, for uh, extensibility using the concept of transaction types. So the most basic transaction type is just send money, send NXT from address to address, but there are also transactions for managers for messages, for asset exchange, for uh, voting, um, privacy features, and many features that I'll touch uh, briefly. Um, okay, now one uh, important um, feature of NXT is the way transaction fees are managed. Transaction fees are uh, mandatory. They are part of the consensus protocol. Since all the NXT were generated at the, NX, at the Genesis block, there is no mining of new NXT. So the only compensation for the NXT miners that we call forgers are the transaction fees. So transactions, minimal transaction fees are mandatory. They reward forgers, prevent spamming the, the blockchain with millions of transactions, and are part of the consensus it's not like a miner can choose which transaction fees to include. There is minimal fees that are enforced by the protocol. Okay. Uh, one concept in uh, NXT which is different than uh, Bitcoin, 
Bitcoin has a Bitcoin wallet, which is a collection of uh, addresses of, of Bitcoin. In NXT, uh, there is the concept of brain wallet, which is rather simple. You start with a passphrase, which should be very, very, something very difficult to guess, like 50 character, random characters or 12 random words chosen from dictionary of 50,000. From this, um, we derive the private key. Let's try, I'll, I'll try to use this. Okay, so from this, we derive the private key of the account and the public key, which is uh, protected by 256 uh, bits. Um, last eight bytes become the account ID is numeric ID, which we transform into our Reed Solomon account, which has error correction. And this is a public NXT address, which always start with NXT dash something. Um, this past phrase must be kept very, very private because anyone who, uh, who knows it can spend your uh, NXT. Um, it's also very good not to forget it or lose it. Um, the passphrase is used for transaction signing and for forging, which means to generate, generating, signing new blocks. Um, the NXT comes with its own integrated wallet, which I'll show later. Um, what the wallet does actually in order to because the passphrase is so important and uh, so critical to keep it secure, it is never sent out, it never leaves your browser. So, the, so when you send transactions, actually what happens is that you send the transactions, <coughs> we call it local signing. What happens, you send the transaction to the node, the nodes formulate the transaction bytes, send it to you back, you sign the transactions locally, and then uh, submit the signed transaction bytes so that your passphrase never leaves your, uh, your workstation, your browser. Uh, however, people that hold millions of NXT, sometimes even this is not secure enough for them. So we also uh, provide a technique to, uh, to sign transactions on a completely offline computer. And, and only transfer it to the online computer using a QR code or, or a USB drive, assuming, of, of course, that your, ca your camera is not hacked and someone can read the QR code. But at some point, uh, you can't have enough security. Okay. Um, another, uh, for, for forging, for generating new blocks, you also need the passphrase in order to sign the new blocks you generate. And usually you generate the blocks on a workstation that runs 24 hour, 24 seven, and you need to keep your passphrase there. So in order not to expose a passphrase of account with millions of NXT, what we do is we have what is called account leasing, where one account, typically a whale with millions of NXT, can lease only the forging balance, only the ability to generate new blocks to another account, which typically has uh, only very few uh, NXT. And only this uh, smaller account is what exposed um, to the public node that actually does the forging. Okay? Um, so, okay, so le let's, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, proof of stake. So the idea of proof of stake, uh, unlike Bitcoin, which generates the, um, which, in which the block generation is a competition between miners about solving uh, completely uh, artificial problems that uh, controls the, the, genera the, um, the generation of the blocks and ensures 10 minutes block time. Um, in NXT, <coughs> blocks are generated, the, your um, probability of generating a block is proportional to the stake that you have, to the, NXT, to the NXT balance that you already have. This is what is called proof of stake. 
And um, NXT is one of the first protocols that actually introduced this uh, concept. Um, two major advantages of this is one, it's energy efficient. You don't need to run these miners, which calculate the SHA-256 or any other um, hashing function required for uh, securing blocks, for uh, generating blocks in the blockchain. Um, instead, you can follow a relatively simple calculation that I'll, I'll touch in a moment. Um, another a very nice use case for proof of stake is for private blockchains. Because if you take Bitcoin and try to use it for private blockchain, then it doesn't make any sense to place miners on the desktops of, of people that use a private uh, blockchain. With proof of stake, you can control the power of each of your, uh, each of each participant in the blockchain by providing it a, a relative stake in the total amount of tokens. Um, there is uh, an ongoing debate in the community about whether proof of stake is secure or not. Um, there are. Uh, Three, I'm not going to get into this uh, very deep, but there are three major claims. One is uh, called nothing at stake. You say, okay, I take, NXT has a Genesis block. I will find all the participants of the Genesis block and ask them to give, them, to give me my, their passphrases. And then I can uh, build exactly the same exactly indistinguishable blockchain that nobody can tell what the true blockchain is and what the fake blockchain and what my blockchain is. Um, so it's, it's, it's a theoretical risk. It's really difficult to find the, the people that are participated in the Genesis block and get their passphrases to start with. But uh, to mitigate against this risk, uh, NXT has a 720 blocks moving checkpoint. So if a workstation receives a fork, which is more than 720 uh, blocks, it immediately rejects it as, as some kind of attack. Um, another, um, another typical uh, complaint is that with NXT, because proof of stake does not require a lot of energy, uh, on Bitcoin, if you see two forks and you try to mine both of them, you are actually you are practically halving your mining power on each fork. In the proof of stake or NXT, because uh, forging is not uh, energy does not require energy, there is no cost to forge on all forks and try to generate and eventually select the fork that works best for you. Um, it's it's true. Um, to, to benefit from this requires a relatively large stake in NXT so that you can generate many blocks proportionally. And, and currently it's not economical and it's not a real risk to, to any proof of stake protocol. Um, there is also a claim that I don't really know what to do about it. Uh, I mean, how to attack it, it says, that consensus requires uh, external resources to burn energy. It's a claim. I'm, I'm not sure how to even <laughs> approach it. It's some kind of academic uh, statement. Um, in practice, this proof of stake works very well. Um, we have very little problems with, uh, with forks. But uh, to be honest, NXT was never challenged the way Bitcoin has been challenged with a massive uh, amount of transactions. Um, so it's still early days. Um, so, so, so let's see, let's delve into it and see how this proof of stake uh, magic works. So, um, so I have this sketch and consider this is a blockchain and these are the latest blocks, okay? And this is the account that would like to forge the next block. So what happens is that each block has a generation signature, which concatenated with a public key of the NXT account, then hash it using SHA-256 to get a value 
which is pseudo-random value between 0 and 2 powered by 2, 56 minus 1, uh, which we call a hit. It's pseudo-random. Okay? We then um, take into account the effective balance of the account to provide better chances for uh, accounts with uh, larger stakes. And we take into account the base target, which, like Bitcoin, is what controls uh, the block generation um, rhythm so that, it's, uh, so that it, it averages one per minute. Okay? Based on this data, we actually calculate the heat time. The heat time tells us what, at, what, at which time this account can forge the next block given the pre this previous block. Okay? And, and again, now there is a race between all the uh, forgers of the NXT, uh, of NXT, and the one with the, heat, with the smaller heat time is the, the one that actually gets to forge the next block. Um, the next block includes the unconfirmed transactions that propagated through the network so far. Um, the, um, the previous timestamp of the timestamp of the block, uh, uh, together with the heat time, is used um, to generate the next base target of the next block, so that the block's uh, generation time averages at one minute. <coughs> and the result is the next block that is broadcasted to the rest of the uh, workstation. The rest of the workstation basically repeats this process to validate that, that the block was uh, it was forged um, at the according to the protocol rules and not before its time and so on. Um, we, we do not use absolute time. We don't synchronize time between the workstation. We allow time drift of up to, six, uh, up to 15 seconds in each direction. Um, we, uh, the the uh, workstation will tolerate block that was forged up to 15 seconds before or after its it's time. Um, maybe one, one uh, thing about uh, forging. Forging relates to chishul, okay? It's not about uh, faking or... Uh, um, so, uh, but there is a lot of uh, <laughs> debate about using this term. Um, so far, it's still the formal uh, term. Um, okay. Um, one nice property of this process, of this forging process in NXT, is that the next forger can be predicted because the, uh, the generation signature of the current block is known, the public keys of all accounts are known, so you can actually tell who is going to generate the next blocks with very high prob probability. And I like to, uh, let me try to show you. Okay, you see, we have this uh, block explorer, and you see in this list that this account, okay, I'll use uh, Okay, this account is about to forge the next block in 64 seconds. Now, this is very nice because now, instead of sending the transactions to propagate through the network, we can simply send it to this, to this guy, to its workstation, and then we can achieve much better uh, transaction rate. Um, so what we call this process, we call it trans uh, transparent forging. Uh, in the early days, it, won, it was one of the big selling points of NXT. However, what happens in um, practice, so um, another idea is also to, if someone does not forge a time, to penalize it so that to uh, discourage people from trying to game the system and, and wait with forging to, in order to collect more transaction fees and, and things like that. The problem with transparent forging is, one, there is a risk of a denial of service attack because if the, uh, the next forger is known, so you can attack it and disable it. 
there is also a privacy risk because in many cases, the, the guy who holds this account don't want uh, people to know his workstation IP because this, will, this is a privacy leak that may lead to some kind of attack. Um, so, so what happens is that this transparent forging is currently still an idea. It's not implemented yet. Uh, we know how to implement it. There is really no need sorry, to implement it right now because we don't have a problem with uh, thousands of transactions per second. Uh, however, this is uh, one of the visions uh, f for the future on how to increase the transaction rate. Um, so just to, uh, as a gimmick, to show you how people are forging NXT without spending any energy. You have here, uh, you see some guy placed here an Odroid. It's like a $60 uh, workstation. Uh, Raspberry Pi, a little bit uh, better than Raspberry Pi. A solar panel and a wireless router. And uh, that's all you need. Here you run Java. On, J on top of Java you install NXT and you, you can forge without uh, wasting any energy. However, typically most people, what they do is they uh, rent a VPS, a Linux workstation at uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Digital Ocean, or something like that, pay $10 a month and leave it running forever. Okay, so there is no problem with arms, the, there is no arm, arms race between the forgers on wasting more energy. So, so one of the nicest thing about proof of stake is that it's very energy efficient. Um, okay, so before I move on, maybe a good time for questions about proof of stake and forging. Yes? Uh, no, because the, the question is if you can game the, for the, the previous block signature by deciding if to include transactions in it or not, or you can actually simulate. But it doesn't work like this because the generation signature does not in take into account the transactions. Only the block, it's, it's based only on the block itself and the, and the signer of the block and other information that is not related to transactions. So there is no way to gain the generation signature. So if I understand correctly, there is only one account holder that can forge each block because it's deterministic. If I'm right about that, what happens if they don't do it because they're offline? If the first uh, forger in line misses its turn, then eventually the next forger in line will, will forge. Uh, yes, I mean, at some point, someone out there is going to... To, uh, after enough time, someone will generate a block and send it to the, to the network. Uh, what is the current uh, market cap of uh, NXT? Um, okay, I decided uh, on purpose to avoid financial uh, <laughs> um, Issues. Let, let's talk about it later, but you can you can see it on any. <laughs> uh, when you showed the the browser, there was a pie chart on the side. Oh yes. Can you describe that? Uh, yes, this is the the pie chart. That's a, a diagram of the of the stake of each holder. You see this guy. Um, he has. Uh, I think he has something like fifty million. NXT. So he has 5% of all the NXT in circulation. What about the other guys? These are all the an anonymous wow. guys with small stakes and these are and this is and, and it's really no it's not necessary to hold 50 million in one account because you can spread it to uh, 50 accounts of 1 million and you don't lose anything by doing by doing so. So 
Yes, uh, you lose convenience, but you gain a bit of security because someone needs to hack now 50 accounts instead of one. So. Okay, uh, so let's... One more. Ah, one more, okay. You said that the minimum tra uh, fee, transaction fee is in the protocol, right? Yeah. So what happens if the value of the tokens uh, become bigger and the mm -hmm. minimum transaction fee becomes too large? Um, the question is what happens if transaction fee becomes large because the value of the token increases. Um, it's, there is uh, an ongoing debate about what should be the fees. I mean, the, the, the folks that actually forge want it to be higher because they only earn maybe a few dollars a month now. And the folks that want to transact want it lower because they want to spawn millions of transactions and pay very little. So, so, so it's a kind of, a, it's, it started as one NXT, and after a lot of debate, after two and a half years, it's still one NXT. <laughs> so, um, changing it requires a hard fork, so it's not a small decision to change the minimum fee. However, for some types of lucrative transactions, we charge more. A uh, thousand fees, there is even one transaction type that charges 25,000 25, NXT fee. Um, <coughs> yeah, okay. Uh, next question. Uh, don't you understand what is the part of the miners or the forgers in validating the transaction itself? Don't they go through every transaction and make sure that it's a buying transaction as well? So, so you, you're asking what? if the forgers also validate transactions. So transactions are in fact validated several times. One, when they are submitted to the network, each node does the first validation that, uh, to see that you paid enough fees, that you have enough balance and, and so on. Don't all the transactions are um, being submitted to the same guy, to the same node? No, everybody, uh, the transactions uh, propagate through the network. Uh, you submit, you can submit any transactions to any node, and this node will start to propagate it inside the network. So um, when, when a forger generates a new block, it validates the transactions again, and when the other workstations, the other nodes receive the block, they validate yet again that the forger did not cheat and include invalid transactions. So it works the same way in all blockchains. Nobody trusts each other, and everybody validates all the time the, the the, what the others do. Okay, so um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the transaction types and what you can do with the uh, next. So um, I think one uh, one important design decision made by the NXT developers is not to allow programmable transactions like uh, in Ethereum, not to allow what we call smart contracts, okay? Um, in retrospect, perhaps it wasn't a very good decision, but this was a decision that was taken uh, re relatively early on. Um, instead, um, our marketing team coined the term smart transactions to try to, uh, <laughs> to enjoy from the hype of uh, smart uh, contracts. Um, and our smart contracts, we call them built-in smart contracts because it's, you can consider it smart contracts, but it's all programmed by the core developers. It's not, pro not like in Ethereum where anyone can generate a smart contract and submit it. In NXT, only the core developers can introduce new smart contracts, or as we call them, transaction types. Um, now let me jump to uh, another presentation that I planned to show a um, few months ago in Amsterdam, but I didn't get to it eventually, so let's try it on you guys. Um, so, see this, is, this tool is called Prezi, if you don't know, it's a very nice presentation tool. Um, so, so really what we have, the smart types of smart transactions that we already have programmed into NXT are, for example, messages, um, 
that, for example, just to give you a sense of the depth of the implementation of messages in NXT. So basically, message is data shared between accounts. Um, it can be encrypted or it can be uh, plain text. Messages can be attached to other transactions. Like uh, think about the uh, 40 bytes you have in OP return, but real message that can be encrypted or non-encrypted. Um, one another important uh, property. This <laughs> dead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think um, one important property is that messages can be prunable. What this means is that you can send rather large messages, even uh, even up to 42k in size. However, the message itself is not saved into the blockchain. Only the hash of the message is saved into the blockchain. And what this means is that um, the, the message, uh, after a um, predefined time period, the message is pruned. Pruned is like uh, Ligzor. Okay. So, uh, so the message itself no longer exists in the blockchain. Only the proof that this message existed. However, if you still like to see this message, you can set up uh, what we call archival nodes that still keep all the data, okay? Not uh, and never uh, actually prune, uh, prune the data. Another uh, function of messages that I think it's the first in the crypto world is that when you send, uh, if you send encrypted message from account A to account B and you like to share it with account C, um, the NXT provides you with a shared key so that you can give the, uh, the third party account so that uh, this account can also decrypt this message. So, so, so encrypt, the encryption can be shared, uh, the ability to decrypt the message can be shared. Okay, another, uh, another option is not just to send a message, but to attach a complete file to a message. Think about Think about a legal contract that you want to send somebody. Um, so, so, so messages are one of the transaction types that we have in NXT. Um, just, yes, we, I wanted to emphasize about prunable messages because we'll, we, we'll get to get this later because we want to leverage it much more now. Um, so the message is not on the blockchain. After 40 days, 14 days, the message is pruned. Only the message hash remains, and archival nodes can recover the message. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go over the. Yes. No. Ah, okay. So I'm not going to tire you with all the transaction types. Just quickly go over the main. Um, let's call it smart things you can do. You can. Set account properties. You can set, uh, one account can set properties on other accounts. This can be used for grouping account, white, white listing, just uh, saving information about specific accounts. Um, cloud da data is like messages, but it's for data up to 42K again, that can be shared with all the accounts. It's like a broadcast of da data into the blockchain. Again, it's prunable, only the message hash remains. Phasing is a very powerful feature that you can think of like a Bitcoin multisig, but, but much more flexible. Um, so ba basically, you say that the transaction is not executed when it's submitted, when it's included in a block, but it's only executed when a certain voting model actually returns true. So, it's, a, it's the most basic t uh, type is that another account approves the transaction. So kind of multi-sig, but you can also use, um, you can also use, um, um, you know, five out of nine accounts. You can also use uh, tokens, not NXT itself, but other tokens in order to do the voting. Uh, you can... Um, you, you can depend the execution of one transaction on another transaction and a few more uh, gadgets like this. Um, we have a very interesting privacy feature we call coin shuffling, which is kind of a coin join, but on the blockchain without a third party uh, website. It's, it's based on an academic paper called the coin shuffling and 
and the writer of the paper actually, actually helped us uh, review the code. Um, so, so, so we do not provide the ultimate flexibility of uh, deploying a programmable contract to the blockchain, but we provide building blocks that lets you do uh, uh, many interesting uh, uh, functions. Okay, on top of that, we build some of the common smart contracts. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have a marketplace. Um, secondary tokens is what we call uh, the monetary system. You can issue your own tokens. Uh, the asset exchange is perhaps the most popular uh, feature of NXT where people can actually uh, create assets in the sense of creating their own uh, crowdfunding project and asking people to invest in it. And it's traded like, like uh, on exchange with bid and ask orders, all stored on the blockchain. Do you have projects already? Uh, so uh, we have, uh, on the asset exchange, we have hundreds of assets. Uh, so uh, this yeah, one is the most you can, um, one of notable assets that we had is, uh, if you know the name cryptocurrency, it started out as an NXT asset. The initial distribution was, uh, before the blockchain was submitted, they used to trade uh, name stakes on the NXT asset exchange. Same is the uh, SIA, if you know the SIA blockchain, it was also uh, uh, many, many scam assets. <laughs> but, uh, um, Supernet, if you heard about, um, you can yeah, you can go and, and check. Um, are they traded on the coin market? Can I see yes, that? some of the assets are traded on the coin market. Um, voting is another very interesting uh, feature. Spe generally, for blockchain, I think voting is a very important application because voting is one application that is very difficult to mechanize because of trust issues, and the blockchain solves this problem because it's trustless. So, so I think voting is, is a very important feature that we already have for almost, uh, for more than a year, I think, in production. And, and it didn't catch, and I'll explain in, in a moment why it didn't catch and how we tried to solve it. Um, okay, so just to uh, sum summarize what we have right now in NXT 1X, what we call. We have about 300 public nodes. We have over uh, 2 million transactions executed. Um, there is uh, an API, very simple API, JSON over HTTP, that anyone can use without permission from anyone to build decentralized applications. Um, demo, let's, let's do a small demo. Um, so, okay, so let's see, okay, this is my um, testnet wallet, okay? <coughs> you see it says here that I'm on uh, testnet right now. Testnet means that it's not the real token. Whatever I can do here, whatever I like, it doesn't affect any, any value, okay? And I, I can see here, you see it's, it's pretty scary because in, in NXT, almost all the features that are available on the server, on the blockchain, actually has UI that is uh, usable on the wallet. Okay, the, it's, the, it's the most basic, uh, uh, the most basic function is to send NXT to another account. So I already prepared an account. I can type an amount. Um, you, see, uh, you see that the fee is one NXT. I need to place the passphrase. I hope it's the correct passphrase. And I can send it. You see, it immediately appears here on the desktop as unconfirmed uh, transaction, okay? Um, you can see the blocks, okay? Um, here you can see that this block includes my transaction, okay? Most of the blocks here are empty because it's testnet. 
Um, I can look, it's, uh, it's actually a very sophisticated piece of uh, uh, client uh, UI. Um, okay, forging, I can, you can see that my node is currently forging. This is a balance that, that it's forging with. Um, if, if you really want to understand all the other uh, asset exchange, uh, let, let me show you one asset, okay. So, um, you, you can see here that this is, asset, this is an asset, Anna B. Um, you can see that there are buy orders um, with, uh, we, which says uh, I want to buy eight pieces at 12 NXT a piece. Um, I can submit, so I can buy, let's try, so I'll, I'll try to buy six, uh, no, I'll, no, no, I need to sell, sorry. I'm gonna sell six at price of 12 and submit it to the network. Um, okay, so, so now you see that um, it shows like this because this is an unconfirmed transaction. It still propagates through the network. Once there is a block, once a block comes, this uh, line should disappear and here the quantity should be reduced so to six, just as you trade on Polonix or wherever you like to trade your altcoins. So, um, and again, this is all saved on the, on the blockchain. Um, okay, another feature I like is that we have inside the wallet, we have integration with Shapeshift. So, so you can actually buy and sell next, trade it with other altcoins from within the, the wallet user interface. It's an excellent way to fund your account for the first time. Um, so, okay, qu questions so far? How many developers do you have? In NXT, in NXT we, we don't have many developers. Um, okay, how many? Yeah, they are, <laughs> it, it's a difficult question because almost there is only one person that works full time on this uh, uh, on this protocol. I I work most of so big so chunk of one, my one, time. One, one, one person show. It's not a one person show. We have in total something like ten contributors, but full time we have only one uh, developers. Okay, if someone has a question, we have several, we have a help desk, uh, which is meant, currently meant by volunteers. We have a product forum, Slack channel, all, all the usual channels. Was yeah. the developer funded? Um, developers are funded by uh, the initial, dis in the initial distribution, some of the out of the one billion NXT, some of them were not claimed by anyone, and these uh, used to fund development. However, it's not, you know, it's not the same scale of funding that folks like Ethereum has. Um, so a year ago, we actually raised, raised more uh, NXT from the community. Um, and we're still, we are still okay, but uh, it's not a very rich, uh, it's not a very rich and rewarding <laughs> um, to, to work as a, as a core developer for NXT. Um, the, the technical challenges are very interesting though. And how do you decide what is your next step or what is your next feature oh. or whatever? Okay, yeah. Um, so how do we decide what to develop? If you, if you don't have a team, how do you decide? No, the, there is a team. There is a distributed team. Um, very, the, the people that work on NXT are very, very dedicated. Don't mistake the lack of funding with lack of enthusiasm. <laughs> so, um, and the decisions, we, we tried many models. I mean, we even tried to let people uh, vote, 
using the stake about which uh, feature to develop, uh, it doesn't work very well because of knowledge gap. Not everything that someone wants to develop is technically feasible to develop. Uh, some features required hard fork, which needs to be played ahead. So, so it's, not, it's not really simple. Um, so in short, the developers decide what to develop. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm, I'm a developer. I, I wrote uh, many of these features or in, were involved in the development of them. Um, okay, I'd like to move on because I have uh, a lot <coughs> more to show you. So, uh, to ask one question? Yep. Uh, since we now have a t uh, two Ethereum, uh, can you tell me uh, what, what can't you do in Ethereum that you can do in the next? What has it been done? What can't you do, or what can you do? Yeah, what can't you do in Ethereum? Oh, I, I, I think yeah. that um, it's very difficult to compete against Ethereum because they have Turing complete, so they can do anything, right? It's, uh, you can program anything into the transaction. However, what we realize, and I think more so, is that all these programs that you see here, to program them correctly in a decentralized uh, environment without allowing hacks and double spending and, and all these problems like what affected the DAO recently, it's very, very difficult, okay? So uh, as far as I can tell, there is nothing like the asset exchange on Ethereum. There is no voting system that is even close to what NXT has in production for a year now in Ethereum. And I'm not even sure it's practical to develop it using their very basic tools, uh, development tools. Okay, uh, but, but there the will be, uh, the way I see it, there will be complex and very flexible uh, applications that will require all the power of Ethereum. The, but there will be applications that are not very complex and does not have a lot of funding. And NXT should be good enough in order for them to, uh, uh, to work. And if they still enjoy the security of the network. Um, so so I, think, I think in the future there will be a, a whole ecosystem of blockchains. So there is no one solution that fits all. So... Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move on. Okay, so now that we have all these wonderful smart contracts uh, working in production, we uh, want to put our sights on two of the biggest problems that blockchain technology has these days. One is what we call the blockchain bloat, and I'll explain it. Um, the, Wik, uh, the Wikipedia uh, donation transaction I made two years ago is still stored on the Bitcoin blockchain and will be stored there forever. And every new Bitcoin nodes that start, any, every new Bitcoin tran uh, workstation needs to download the whole Bitcoin uh, network and revalidate all these transactions. I mean, it, they have a workaround they can... They can download it using BitTorrent or just trust someone to give you the 70 gigabytes blockchain, but then you lose uh, security. If you really want to work by the protocol, you have to revalidate everything because all block depends on the block before and block signature depends on the transaction, so you have to revalidate everything from start. Okay, this is what's called the blo blockchain bloat. Very big problem for all the blockchains, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Next, and any other blockchain out there. Another a problem that we realized with NXT, for example, when trying to implement the voting system, is that the dual usage of the NXT token, both for forging, paying fees, and securing the network, and as transfer of value, is very problematic. Because, for example, if you want to uh, issue a voting for 10,000 people, you need to introduce these 10,000 people to Next, because otherwise they cannot submit transactions because they need to pay the fees, transactions fees in Next. And trying to initialize 10,000 accounts with secure passphrases is, is a 
very big task, and of course, also paying uh, transaction fees, uh, relatively large transaction fees, are something that deter uh, a lot of uh, use cases from using NXT. Um, so in order to solve these two problems and few others, we, uh, we started a very ambitious uh, project we, we call NXT 2.0, and our marketing team coined the term the Ardor platform. Okay? Um, so what is the Ardor platform? So the idea is to separate the, um, the security, the token used for security, the blockchain used for security, from the operation blockchain that actually manages the, the operational um, the, the transaction, like uh, voting, asset exchange, messages, and so on. So, so the idea is that you'll have the Ardor blockchain, one blockchain to rule them all, and it's only the Ardor blockchain is only used for uh, forging and securing the network. The only transactions stored on the Ardor blockchain are transactions that affect the NXT balance of the forgers, okay? It can be uh, typically send money transactions. And for the Ardo transactions, we save the full history. However, for the operational applications, we allow to spawn child blockchains. And don't think if anyone is familiar with side chains, with a Bitcoin side chain, it's completely different concept, so, so don't get confused. Um, the idea is that every blockchain, or at least non-empty block in an operational chain, will propagate as transaction into the main chain, into the Ardor chain, okay? Um, and what we gain by this is that the operational chains can be pruned. Remember message pruning? We will now be able to also prune the blockchain itself. We will only for the operational chains, we will only uh, keep 24 hours of, uh, of blocks for each one of them. And we can have many of them. We can have one for uh, that some business uh, pegged to the US dollar. We can have uh, one that designate as the uh, tokens for online game, for to track social networks likes. I'm, I'm talking about real use cases that people come to us with. Uh, for mayor, mayor elections, uh, voting, for concert tickets, okay? So that you don't need to pay a third party to sell the tickets. Um, so all these blockchains will be pruned. They, only, they will only save their current states, their account balances, and a little bit of history, okay? Um, all chains will use the same source code. It's not like side chains that uh, we'll have that are experimental chains, and I'm not exactly sure how, how in Bitcoin it's supposed to work even. Um, and all chains are maintained by all nodes. Um, accounts, the accounts we talk about, we talked about with the passphrase, will be global. So for, so for your same passphrase can be used on all the on the main chain for forging and on all the operational chains. Um, typical, some entities, like the assets, will, will also become global, which means that assuming that we can have someone that is willing to peg its blockchain to the US dollar and another business that pegs to, the, to Bitcoin and another one that pegs to Euro, we can now trade assets, not, di not just directly with NXT, which has limited use case, but directly with, uh, with the fiat currencies or Bitcoin or, or whatever people would like to trade assets against. Okay, and, and of course there will be arbitrage between uh, the Bitcoin pegged chain and the US dollar pegged chain. Um, other entities like voting or uh, currencies, what we call tokens, uh, will be uh, child chain specific, okay? So, it's, um, 
I think it's quite a radical uh, idea that I haven't seen anyone else working on something like this. Um, and I'll try to, um, I'll try to, to clarify what it means by let's think together how a new node will join this type of, uh, of operation. So a new node that starts will, of course, need to download the whole uh, Ardor blockchain, the main chain, because this chain is uh, required for uh, verifying the forging uh, operations, the forging balances. However, this will only have the a fraction of the transactions that are currently on the network, because only the transactions that affect directly affect balances will be there, and uh, and transaction per block, which hopefully blocks. If blocks are full, then it's a ratio of maybe one to one hundred. Or, I mean, think about Bitcoin that has hundreds transactions in a block. So, so we reduce transaction by a factor of possibly hundred. By, by this design. However, from the operational blockchain, all this new node will have to get is a snapshot of the current balances for a certain block. And from this block, the remaining of the blocks that passed since, uh, in any case, no more than uh, 24 hours of, uh, of, of blocks. So, so it allows you to um, synchronize a new, a new node much, much faster. Um, so the child chains are prunable. Uh, forging is only on the main chain. Okay? Um, child chains has their own token. And we have a mechanism to exchange it into the ardor. The ardor token is a token that's used for forging. The idea is that there will be a new role called uh, bundlers, okay? What the bundlers will do, they will take child chain uh, blocks and will bundle them into, uh, into main chain transactions. Thereby, they will receive the fees in the child chain token and pay the fee in the ardor token, in the main chain token. Thus, uh, basically establishing an exchange rate between the child chain token and the main chain token. Um, so, uh, so this is what's supposed to give the child chain token um, value. In addition, it, the, it has an advantage that whoever g deals with the child chain token no longer need to worry about the main chain token, about the forging process. So now you can have applications of voting that does not even care that they run on, a, on the NXT network. The only one who needs to care is the bundler, which uh, can be the manager of the elections, for example, or the business that does the pegging to US dollar. Okay, and this business will have to make sure that the transactions, uh, that the <coughs> transactions from the child chain, the blocks from the child chain become transactions on the main chain. Okay, so uh, some of the, uh, again, some of the entities like assets and accounts will become global, some will become child chain specific. You said that all the nodes are verified on the transaction in the side chain, right? Yes. So, so, so the, 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 so, yes, all, all the nodes will verify all the child chain transaction. Transaction verification is relatively cheap operation. Um, and, and if transaction volume becomes a big issue, we can come up with a transparent forging. Remember that you can identify the next forger and send the transactions directly to the next forger so that they don't need to propagate through the network. Okay. Uh, are the children hierarchical? So uh, right now we are only talking about one level of hierarchy. Um, can't think of a good use case for making a child chain tree. It's, the, it's already complex enough uh, as, it, as it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Are all the child chains compatible, or a child chain of one block is different from another block? Okay, all the ch uh, is all the child chains compatible? <coughs> all the child chains uh, rely on the same source code, so that uh, the, it's not like one is a. Uh, uh, deals with uh, Ethereum transactions and one with Bitcoin transactions. 
זה all based on the same NXT uh, source code. The only, initi- at least initially, the only customization you'll be able to do is to block certain transaction types on certain uh, child chains. So when you submit a new, a new child chain, you'll, you can say that certain transaction types are not supported because of, uh, you don't want to, uh, because of some regulations that you don't want to break or you don't want to expose yourself to some risk or something like that. Um, uh, Gideon? You say that uh, some blocks from the child chain become transactions on the main chain. Can you go into a bit more detail what that means, okay. or is it not known yet? Okay, so, so, uh, so think about a child chain that has uh, now voting. It has many, many transactions, okay? And it has uh, account balances in, in the child chain token. So what it does, when you have, you'll still have one minute block time also on the child chain. Perhaps we can also somehow play with it so the child chain has different block time, but not sure yet. So, so when this transac- uh, child chain generates a block, it actually calculates a snapshot. Snapshot of all the account balances, okay? Um, and a hash of all the transactions. This process, I agree with you, it's not completely well defined, okay? What will be stored in the transaction submitted to the main chain will be only a hash that allows other workstation to repeat this calculation and verify that, uh, because all nodes has the same state all the time, and all nodes can verify all the transactions. All nodes uh, see all the transactions. All nodes will be able to play back this calculation and verify that the hash that submitted in this uh, child chain block transaction actually matches the correct state at the time of uh, submission. So it's, it's very similar to people that talk about putting a hash of a separate blockchain into Bitcoin off return. It's a similar kind of idea. I, I, guess, I guess it's similar to the, to the or pretend maybe. Yeah. How do you prevent the spamming on the side chain? Okay, how do you prevent spamming on the child, uh, side chains? Spamming on the side chains is uh, less of a problem because because what really matters is the main chain. The child chain, remember, only saves 24 hours history and the account balances, okay? So you can spam it as much as you like. There is a limit of how much spam will be stored because there will still be a limit of transactions per block. so, so it will still be manageable even if the fees on the child chains are very small or even non-existent or, or even zero fees uh, completely. But it can, it can run out of bandwidth. Yes. Uh, okay, so bandwidth again, you, you're right that bandwidth could be an issue. We think that it's an issue that will be able to handle differently. Okay, so, so you're right, Spa- space will be less of a plum- problem, but bandwidth could still be an um, issue. Let's see what I have next. Okay, um, I see many looking at it, watch. <laughs> um, okay, so um, regarding roadmap, there is a uh, we intend to go live with uh, this NXT 2.0 design in about a year from now. You, you'll have to understand it's a, it's a major refactoring of everything because everything in NXT right now assumes a single blockchain. Statically assumes a genesis, one genesis block, um, that each account always uh, belongs to one blockchain, asset belongs to one blockchain. So it's almost a complete rewrite of, uh, of, the, uh, of the code. So it's a very, it's a very large and ambitious uh, project. Um, we currently, our goal is to go live at uh, next year. However, meanwhile, we started with the distribution of the Ardo token because the Ardo token is what will enable forging on the, uh, on the main chain of the, of the NXT 2.0 design. So it has to be distributed, uh, has to, to have very good distribution, otherwise we'll have the same problems that we had in the few 
passed with NXT that people claim that it's not fair how the distribution went to people that registered on some forum at some time. So, so what we do, we actually, uh, when we released version uh, 1.9, we actually started distribution of the ardor as an asset on the NXT blockchain, on the NXT 1X blockchain. So now we have three months until, um, this is not completely accurate what it's written here, we have three months where the Ardor uh, token is distributed to existing NXT holder. So all you need in order to have the Ardor token is to have NXT in your balance, okay? So, and every hour we calculate a snapshot of the NXT balances and count the Ardor tokens that uh, at this time, at, at the end, it's going to be block 1 million, there's going to be automatic distribution of the Ardor to the accounts according to uh, the NXT balances, but not, of course, as a new blockchain because the new blockchain will be ready only next year, but as an asset on the NXT 1.0 blockchain. <coughs> Remember, we have assets, so we will now have, have Ardor asset. Uh, once you have Ardor asset, it will be traded. You can trade it on NXT. If uh, Polonix or anyone else wants to implement trading, um, it's also possible that it will be traded uh, globally. Um, later, okay, later when NXT 2.0 goes live, it's likely to go live with only one child chain in the beginning, okay? And this child chain will be distributed again this time on the, uh, based on the NXT balances at this time, okay? So, so we, try to, we try hard to give people incentive to keep their uh, NXTs and not to dump them uh, because when you keep NXT, you get the Ardor token now over the next three months and you'll also get the operational token of the first child chain. Okay, later we think that at this time we, won't, we still won't have the, the option to create new child chains. It will come later. So when you'll be able to create new child chains, then you'll have the multiple tokens ecosystem that I talk about, that I talked about. Um, so, uh, okay, and one, uh, another important question is what's gonna happen to the NXT blockchain itself? The NXT blockchain uh, will continue to run in parallel to all this, uh, to all this design, okay? If the, as long as there are forgers that will maintain the network, uh, it will continue to operate. Um, it's, we, we don't think we will put a lot of effort into the NXT 1X uh, uh, blockchain, once, uh, especially not once 2.0 is released, but, but it's, still gonna, it's still gonna work. Um, okay, so quick uh, questions. Yep. Regarding the messages on the main chain, what is the fee for a message? Messages on main chain goes like this. The, on the basic message, if your message is less than 32 bytes or is prunable, then you pay only one NXT. If you have a message that is permanent, non-prunable, um, you pay uh, according to the size, to the bytes in the message. Every 32 bytes will add another uh, one NXT as, as fee. <clears throat> uh, so the snapshot for the uh, uh, child chain token, the uh, FNX, yeah. that's going to be a, a snapshot of a specific time or is it also going to be averaged out over a period of time, like the uh, popular uh, Okay, so there is no firm decision about this because first, of, first and foremost we don't want to get into legal problems with okay. anyone with any securities agency or, or, or anything. So, so we have to, make, to be very careful not to just uh, violate some, uh, some laws or, or something like this. So, uh, so I think that at some point between here and here, we'll have to seek uh, also legal advice about how to do this without uh, exposing ourselves to something. Um, currently, the idea is just to have one snapshot at this uh, cutoff period. Um. 
uh, is there an organization or something like that uh, that uh, holds the project uh, running? I mean, is the company uh, you're talking about marketing? Who, <coughs> who is uh, funding, okay. who is leading the marketing uh, team? Okay, so who is funding? Who is funding and leading NXT? So um, <coughs> there is uh, an entity called the NXT Foundation, which is uh, today is only, only it's a non-profit organization, mostly financed by the existing NXT uh, holders, um, and they are doing most of the marketing. Some people do simply volunteer. Some people are has large stake in NXT, so they have incentive to promote it. So no, no clear cut uh, answer to who finance. Sometimes I'm even surprised. <laughs> there are two related questions. So are there any public blockchains that have been forked from NXT that at some point, and second of all, like if, if you were to break down blockchains into families of you know, similar chains, so for example, you've got Bitcoin and Litecoin as one family, what other chains would you say are in the NXT family in terms of kind of the architecture and philosophy of design? Okay, so, so first question is, was NXT forked to other blockchains? It was forked many, many times, dozens of times. Most of these forks did not succeed well. However, some blockchains that were inspired by NXT, not really forked, are doing well. Um, for example, NEM is one of them. Um, th there are other, uh, other guys, I think. Uh, Emelcoin? Emelcoin? Maybe, I, I don't know. NEM is the... I think I think NEM is not a clone, but it's uh, yeah. it's a team from a renegade team from NXT. <laughs> <laughs> that that's it. And what was it? Your yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay. Um, so and and in fact, it became such a problem that people used to fork NXT before we even released a generally available version. It was already forked and hyped by someone else that claimed better distribution or something like this. So much so that at some point we changed the usage license um, so that it's no longer MIT li license. Uh, instead it's uh, GPL, okay? So what it means that if you uh, fork NXT, you have to release your source, co your source code to the public or you'll have to obtain a commercial license. That's also uh, perhaps a good measure <coughs> to benefit from private chains. So that uh, if someone creates a private chain based on NXT, they will have to seek license from the NXT developers. And the uh, inventor of NXT moved to another project, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Okay. <laughs> Inventor of NXT is a guy known as BC Next. Okay, he, he, he appeared on the Bitcoin Talk forum and uh, disappeared shortly after uh, releasing the Genesis block. He disappeared, and nobody really knows. <laughs> it's, uh, I remember some story about a large theft of NXT a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what attacks or thefts have there been on the network? Okay, yeah. So that's another interesting uh, story. We call it, uh, especially, I'm, I'm okay, man. Yeah. <laughs> so especially in, the, in light of the recent events with Ethereum, there was a hack on one of the exchanges called, Chinese exchange called Bitter, that one of the biggest exchanges and 50 million NXT were stolen, 5% of all NXT in circulation. So then started a process that is very simpler, similar to what happened with the DAO, where people try to uh, argue that, you, that we need to reverse this transaction. It was only one transaction that stole the whole wallet of Bitter into the hacker's uh, account. Um, what happens with NXT First of all, we didn't have time, because with uh, Ethereum, there was a whole month to decide what to do. With NXT, you have to decide with, with, within 720 blocks 
which is half a day. You have to decide what to do, and it's simply not, even if you want to hard fork an, a network of 300 nodes, it's not enough, okay? So it's not enough time to implement this. So, so the hack was, uh, it went through, someone talked with a hacker, he returned some of the phones. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, how this ended, but there was no hard fork. What did happen is that the developers did prepare another version with where this transaction did not occur mm -hmm. and, and ask the com community if they want to move to this version or not. So, it, so it's very simple to what the Ethereum uh, developers did, maybe minus that the NXT developers did not state their position, like the Ethereum developers that were very pro the hard fork. So, so I think that, that may be a, a point where Ethereum made a mistake that they did not say there was a hack, it's not our uh, uh, fault, it was a bug in the DAO. You decide. You, uh, we give the miner options, the miner needs to decide. In Ethereum, they become too emotionally involved, I think, in, in this decision. Um, yeah. So what happened in the end? Did they switch to the other? Do you have a chain? Where, where, no, uh, no, as I say, the hard fork code mainly uh, barely made it on public until the 720 okay. blocks uh, limit passed, and then there is no way to hard fork right. because all the workstations will reject your. Uh, sure. but, your, but no, your one, your no, one choose, no one chose to, uh, to switch to a the. No, ma maybe few chose, but not the majority. Right. Okay. <laughs> I had another slide but about, uh, I think it's going to be interesting if you are... Have a minute. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wanted to talk about hard forks. Because, why? Because it's, it's a hot topic right now. And because in NXT we are kind of used to a hard fork every six months. The Bitcoin developers created a perception <laughs> that hard fork is a disaster. It's something that it's better to completely change the, the protocol and create a soft war, fork with segregated witness instead of just uh, changing one parameter, increasing the block size. So I wanted to give my perspective from NXT, how we implement hard fork. And, and it's not that difficult, actually. Uh, what we do, for example, when we uh, introduce a new transaction type, of course we need a hard fork because the old, the, the nodes based on old code will not, uh, won't be familiar with this transaction type, so they reject it and nodes that has the updated code know how to uh, accept this transaction type, so the network will split. Um, so we first implement it on testnet, test it properly, and so on. Then we release the hard fork code on the mainnet, but we do not yet allow to issue the transaction type. We give a deadline, okay, for all <coughs> nodes to upgrade, which can be, which can vary from a, a month into the future to three months into the future. And whoever uh, does not upgrade in this time frame Tough luck, they, they are left on a fork of the old version and eventually they get convinced that they are on an old version and they uh, upgrade. Um, now, what happened, we never had an incident like the Ethereum Classic. We never had an NXT Classic uh, <laughs> uh, problem, even though we are at the same parameters. People can decide if enough stake, if 50% of the stake will decide to stay on the old version and not to upgrade to the, to the uh, new hard fork, uh, the, the network, they the will become two chains, the NXT Classic and the new, and the NXT, the new NXT. So, uh, so, so we are exposed to the same <laughs> risk, it never really materialized, and I think that the reason it didn't materialize, first it's because there was no economical incentive, I, I think, but it's also important that the developers and the community managers are aligned and know how to uh, explain the, the, the message uh, properly. Um, but, but hard forks, what my message is hard fork is not that 
uh, difficult to implement and certainly I think the Bitcoin, Bitcoin community inflated the risk out of proportions uh, completely. Okay? So, okay, so yeah. <laughs>